Here is our now familiar list of strengths and weaknesses for evaluating a economic system. So let's take a look at a few of these before we get to the conclusion of the chapter. So how does a state economic system encourage or help prosperity? Um, it basically comes down to handling the surplus in a productive manner. Um, when the state is providing infrastructure, that's only going to help economic activity in the market work that much better. Um, obviously, we know the state would be good at dealing with collective action problems. And I guess a better way to put it is that there are collective action problems that will mess up market activity. So a state can correct them and help the prosperity in that manner. Um, certainly, all sorts of laws will be helpful from the state. Um, they can protect us with information about fraud. They can uh, stop the companies from colluding and, and encouraging competition instead. That's what antitrust policies are all about. Um, so these are just some of the services that if a state is well run and is um, not predatory, these are the ways that it could actually help encourage and grow prosperity for the country. But we know the overall judgment of a economic system success is, does it generate a surplus and does it use the surplus productively? So it is possible that the state may not use their surplus productively. It could waste resources. It could actually interfere with the efficiency of the market allocation. So there's the problem of activity happening by the government is outside the market. So it's, it's outside the competitive disciplinary forces of the market. And so that can lead to inefficiency. Um, it could use the productive excuse me, the surplus in a non-productive way, uh, maybe spending the tax revenue on programs that don't raise productivity, um, that, that could be an issue. And then of course, the law of unintended consequences. How many programs are there out there that are intended to do X and oops, didn't see that coming. Um, so those are various ways that the state could actually lead to lower um, prosperity. Since the Great Depression, um, there was a shift in the view of the role of the state and it's seen as needed to provide stability that it can use its power to uh, change government spending and taxation which is fiscal policy to try and deal with the instability of the economic business cycle uh, if there's a central bank, they can do similar um, control of the policies through monetary policy. There's the financial regulations. Um, if you have uh, regulations that prevent um, activities, we might be following your self-interest, but it's harmful for the public interest. We can have financial regulation to prevent that. Industrial policy is uh, helping your economy develop, maybe you're aiding a particular industry, um, all the uh, green energy that was uh, popular recently was a type of industrial policy. Um, some nations that were undeveloped have found themselves growing very well with well-directed industrial policy. Trade policy has certainly been something we have seen in the Trump administration and can make a big difference to the economy overall. So the basic idea is that in a state-run economic system, um, you can actually enhance stability by using the power of the state to combat some of the cyclical and unstable nature that the economy might have otherwise. However, <laughs> in this section, uh, we always have the however. Um, Market-centered systems are generally considered unstable just because of the volatility of the economic business cycle. But sometimes the cure is worse than the illness. <laughs> 
So they might actually try to do some of those government policies that we mentioned and um, maybe either not apply them or not gauge them correctly and could actually make the instability even worse. Um, so if you have the power of fiscal policy, if you use it in a way that helps a particular party, the incumbent party, as they're going into the reelection, that can actually exacer um, exacerbate the political business cycle. Um, there's always the issue that you can choose to put a policy in place at a time when it's politically in demand, but the time it takes to implement it might mean that the actual impact on the economy will hit too late. Um, there's always the issue of crowding out when you're talking about government spending because maybe you're not actually adding to the economy, you just pushed out some private activity. Uh, and then there's the idea of rational expectations. Well, people will kind of see where this is going and just kind of jump to that end. And you essentially have no real impact with all of your uh, fancy government interventions. Looking at sustainability again, um, this would be a potential area where the state could have um, some good uh, impact. Um, obviously, environmental regulations, they can use taxes and subsidies to deal with externalities. Uh, creating markets might be um, uh, issuing certificates that allow you to pollute a certain amount and letting the companies trade amongst themselves and kind of arrive at a market price of pollution. I know it might sound a little weird, but it's actually considered one of the more efficient ways to handle it because the reality is you probably cannot take it to zero without taking production to zero. Um, so there's all sorts of policies that the state can uh, put in place to try and deal with these issues and help create a more sustainable uh, level of production and quality of production. And here's the however, <laughs> state-centered economic systems have struggled with sustainability. Uh, we can look at it across time, what brought them down. Early empires fell because of not using the surplus productively, um, oppression, and potentially not having the incentives in place for innovation to keep them growing. Mercantism fell when the manufacturers gained power to resist the state, and it's going to, um, as we saw in the state, no, the market-centered economic system chapter, uh, as the various prerequisites are met we're, going to s met, we're going to see capitalism rise out of the ashes. Um, and then in general, communism, fascism, socialism, however you define them, <laughs> they have overall been less efficient than market-centered systems. Human development will be the last of the eight criteria that we're going to discuss today. Um, if you have any questions on any of the others, feel free to ask your professor about them. But it would seem that the state could have a really healthy role in human development. Um, provision of public goods like education could certainly be a benefit. Um, with any public good, the market alone won't provide it or won't provide it enough. So having the state being able to step in and um, and, and solve that problem, that market failure is potentially very helpful. Um, the idea of the arts and merit goods um, is that these are also things that may not be prevented enough with just the market in charge. Some of the merit goods that were mentioned are school lunches for low-income students, uh, early childhood development programs, food stamps, and then subsidizing the arts will make the events um, by orchestras or dance companies accessible to a wider audience. Uh, it will make it so there's um, higher capacity for uh, producing and appreciating the arts. And remember, this is about human development, so it's just making our lives a little bit better. And then, of course, um, laws to protect us uh, as far as health and safety. So these are all things the state can do to promote human development. The main concern here is where a state can cause problems with human development is if by providing certain programs, they're undermining the civil society's ability to provide it, or even undermining just the individual's desire to take care of himself. Um, so essentially, it's another type of institutional crowding out. So pre the progressive movement of the 1800s, 
there was no state provided uh, benefits, whether you're talking unemployment or social security or any sort of welfare payment that we think of today. Um, and so all of those needs were taken care of in the civil society. Um, so it was up to churches or other community organizations to deal with these sorts of things. Uh, one of the reasons progressive movement rose up was a desire to not have people fall through the cracks so that you would have the state provide these sorts of things. It'll be uniform. It'll be fair. Won't that be better? And all this is pointing out is there's also a dark side to the state providing it, which is now what purpose does the community have? The weakening of the community um, can you know, cause problems in the overall economic system, even if you're talking about a state-centered economic system. To conclude the chapter, he comes back to the idea of the challenge of maintaining a developmental state. Um, in order to be a successful state-centered economic system, it needs to be a developmental state, but it will very easily fall into a predatory state without certain safeguards um, to prevent it. And so he mentions two ways that predatory states can be curbed. One is trying to minimize the size and function of the state because one of the big corrupting potential impacts is the benefit of rent seeking. So if the state does less, then there's less to benefit. Therefore, there's less reason to change it into a predatory state. There's less, you, there's less you're gonna benefit from. And then you could also instead look at increasing the strength of the state. So it's strong enough to withstand the seeking of favors. Now, if it's this strong, it, how can it be this strong to resist <laughs> uh, pressures from those who are seeking to use it badly and yet still be accessible and responsive to the will of the people, the, the ones they should actually be listening to? And this is the heart of what a lot of constitutions strike or, or have struggled with and have tried to strike a balance with things like a bicameral legislature where there's one part that's very responsive to the people and there's another part that's a little more distant from the people. So if rent seeking is essentially the issue, um, it, what it really is showing us is just the problem of money and politics. Um, so there's some institutional changes that could be done to protect the autonomy state by essentially trying to restrict the influence of money in politics. And you hear about a lot of these. Um, we talk about possibly paying for the public paying for political campaigns so that then politicians don't have to get contributions from other interests. And then presumably once you get contributions, you might owe them things. So that's a possibility. Um, obviously anything you can do to increase the transparency of who is donating money and those sorts of interactions would be important. Uh, one that's probably not discussed enough because it's not in the favor of the incumbents is uh, dealing with gerrymandering where they draw districts so that these districts are safe Democrat seats and these districts are safe Republican seats. If we had districts drawn in a way where very few seats are safe, then the only way to win is to kind of tack to the center and you would end up with a lot of politicians who are working towards the center in order to preserve their, their seat. Um, but when you have a whole bunch of safe seats, then the more extreme you get, the more you are rewarded at home and the more challenging it is for there to be any sort of consensus. Um, there's been some court cases on what is free speech. Um, is corporations giving money free speech? Are corporations essentially people? Uh, and then media regulations um, would certainly be an issue. Um, independent media is very important to provide us the transparency that we need. Um, it, they, we need a media who would go after corruption on either side. Uh, a media that would tell us about uh, influence peddling done by any side. That would be uh, a very good thing to have to prevent your developmental state from falling into a predatory state. So all of those are good. They're all things we should be striving for. We should, they're all things we should be aware of to as we try and tr protect our developmental state if we are living in one. 
Um, but the truth is money and political power are inseparable. Um, those sorts of institutional reforms we just spoke of maybe can weaken the connection between money and power um, and, and just enough <laughs> so that the states can be the strong enough to uh, resist the interest group pressure and still be responsive to the people they are there to serve. All right, two economic systems down, one to go. We have the community-centered economic system in the next chapter.